Good morning. What a grace. What a grace and a privilege that we have the opportunity to come together this morning, that we have the resources and the freedom to be able to come together, worship the Lord as one. Thank you for coming um, in these different and difficult times. We appreciate your coming out uh, to be a part of the ministries. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 117. Psalm 117, which is only two verses. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord, all nations. Magnify Him, all peoples. Because His loving kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord is everlasting. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we worship You. And we praise you because you have poured your spirit, the spirit of the risen Christ, into our hearts. You've given us faith and repentance. So we come to worship you. We worship you in spirit and truth under the umbrella of your grace. It's in Christ we pray. Amen. As we stand this morning, we just have an opportunity to lift our voices and worship to the Lord. So let's do so this morning. <clears throat>
Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that you would hear our prayers and answer according to your will. That your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we pray for your church here, that you would strengthen us, encourage us, keep us diligent and devoted and fruitful in our mission. Father, we pray for the sick, that you would heal them and comfort them. We pray for the hurting and the lonely, that you would comfort them, come by their side, work through your providences to gather around them and lift them up and strengthen them. Father, for the weak, for those caught in a snare of sin, I pray that you would restore them. I pray that you would bring them under the conviction of the Spirit, that they would give their lives anew to the Lord Jesus Christ in full devotion to him. Father, we pray for the lost, that you would save them by your word and spirit through the proclamation of Christ's death and resurrection. Father, we pray. We pray for our community, nation, and world for a great move of the spirit, a gospel move where many would be saved to your glory for your name. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh
Well, beloved, it is good to be with you. Has 2020 been uh, like you expected? Well, I hope and pray that by God's Spirit, you're continuing to walk that walk of faith and keep that eternal perspective. And uh, the only way we do that is through the Spirit, through God's grace. But I pray you're fighting that battle and striving um, to keep the faith in these trying and different times. And also keep things in perspective. Uh, Because these trials are, relatively speaking, although they are trials, um, relatively speaking, compared to what we could be going through, um, not that big. All right, ready to pray? Yeah, a few of you, I think four. Ready to pray? All right, let's pray together. Father, we confess here, uh, though we maybe haven't thought about it for four, five, six, or seven days, we confess that we need your word. We need your word into our hearts and minds to transform the way we uh, live that we would live for your glory. Father, it's our collective prayer right now that you would bless us through your word and spirit. Show us your kindness to us in Christ. Uh, For those who are outside of Christ, I pray that you would stir up their hearts, awaken them, that they would be born again and come to faith in Christ. Show them your kindness toward them in Christ, expressed through his death, and resurrection. And Father, for those of us who are in Christ, sanctify us. It is your will that we be sanctified. And only you can do that work. We confess. We confess our sin. We confess our guilt. We confess our struggles. And we ask for your help. Dear Lord, help us by your word and spirit. Father, would you humble us this morning? Would you humble us and sanctify us according to your purpose? It's in Christ we pray. Amen. I want you to imagine it's a Saturday morning and I send out an email asking for your help at the house and if you come and help me for the full day, I'll give you $200. And so let's just say, for instance, all of you in this row answer that call and you come to work the full day for $200. Around lunchtime, I see that there's no way we're going to get the work done, so I send out a second email. Please come and help. Can you help for the second half of the day? So let's just say the people in the middle row came in the middle of the day. And then it's around dinner time, and I look at the work, and I think there's no way we're getting this done. And so I send out a third email. Please come and help. It will just be an hour. But if you can help, come and help. And so let's say the people in these rows come and help for that last hour. And we get the work done, and at the end of the day, I line everyone up to receive their pay. Now, I want you to pay attention Carefully. The people who came last, I have them line up first. And the people who came first, I have you line up last. And so now, where are the people who came last? They are lined up. And where are the people who came first? You are lined up last. And I begin to pay. And the people who came last, who are lined up first, I pay $200. I pay $200. And then they go on their way. The people who came in the middle of the day get paid $200. And as the people who came first who had been lined up, as they observe that I'm paying the ones who came last and the ones who came in the middle $200, what they were promised, they get very, very excited. (laughs) Surely... He's going to give us more than that. If they only got $200, or if they got $200, not only, and if they got $200, yeah, he promised us $200 for the, for the full day, but obviously those standards have changed. We're going to get $300, or $400, or $600. Who knows? And they get paid $200. And their excitement turns to grumbling and complaining, thinking that I was unfair. Was I unfair to them or not? Do they have 
and reasonable grounds for grumbling and complaining against me. Well, that's what happens in our story this morning. And it happens because the disciples needed to learn a lesson. And I'm guessing and thinking each one of us, maybe in a different way in the details, need to hear that same message. Would you turn to Matthew 20, please? Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16 is our text this morning. This is nearing the end of Christ's ministry. Traditionally, it's called the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. And brethren, that's what we are. We are laborers. We are workers in the Lord's vineyard. Matthew 20, beginning in verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner or a master of the house. Is literally what it says there. House master. And that it, this is a landowner. He has the means to employ others. Okay? Who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Guys, that's most likely around 6 a.m., okay? When he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for a day. A denarius, forget about the exact amount, that's a day's wage. Okay? That's a day's wage. He agreed to them that they would work for a denarius for the whole day. He sent them into his vineyard. And then he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. That's around 9 a.m. Okay? 9 a.m., three hours later. And to those he said, you also go into the vineyard. And whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. Verse 5. And again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour. That's around noon and around 3 p.m. And he did the same thing. What, what did he do? What's the same thing? He brought others to work in his vineyard for whatever portion of the day was left. And he said, I'll pay you what's right. Verse 6. And about the 11th hour. Now, if you're tracking, you should be able to guess that. That's 5 p.m. Okay. He went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day long? Well, they said to him, because no one hired us. Well, he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages. Now, evening, we'll find out, we'll see exactly how we know this in a moment, but that's six o'clock. So that last group only worked how many hours? One group. And again, we'll see in the text how we know that in just a moment, okay? When the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group first. Last group to the first. All right. Verse 9, when those hired about the 11th hour came, each one received a denarius. Child of God, they received a full day's wage for working one hour in the master's vineyard. When those hired first, 6 a.m., came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner. They're attacking him. They're not just grumbling about him, although I'm sure they're doing that. They're grumbling at him, saying, these last men have worked only one hour. That's how we know. They came at five, they worked till six. And you have made them equal to us. And see, now that's what's really got them upset. Who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and said to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. 
Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go. But I, I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. And is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? Or because I am good? Verse 16. So, the last shall be, and the first last. Now, I've called this sermon the generosity of God because his generosity is the takeaway point. Okay, it's underneath every other lesson and truth and application that uh, will come from this passage. Verse 15, is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? The generosity of the master who represents Christ, who is God, the generosity of God, the goodness of God. We're going to see that God's generosity brings us into a glorious kingdom. His generosity is brought to us by a generous master. It's the only way we could be brought into the kingdom, is if the kingdom is brought to us by a generous master, Christ. And we're also going to see that God's generosity is our only hope and assurance of a gracious reward. And hopefully it's implied when you hear that, that our work in the kingdom and the amount of our work in the kingdom is not our hope and assurance of a gracious reward. So he brings us into a glorious kingdom. He, he brings us there. He brings that kingdom to us through a generous master, Christ. And this generosity of God is our only hope and assurance of a gracious reward. But first, we've got to look at the context. And also... I want us to spend some time meditating on this key truth of God's generosity. All right. The context. The context is this. There's a big problem in the heart of the disciples. See if you can figure out what it was. In chapter 14, they told Jesus, send the crowds away so they could go and get their own food. In chapter 19, they turned away children, and they rebuked people who were bringing children. In chapter 19, they say this, Jesus, we've left everything for you. What will we get? What will we get in the kingdom? And they're thinking their land, houses, wealth, influence. In chapter 20, right after this, James and John's mother, along with James and John, looking at the cross-references in the other Gospels, uh, James and John's mother makes a special request that her sons would have the two highest positions in the kingdom. Is the problem in their heart be becoming clear to you? In Mark chapter 9, somebody was doing ministry in the name of Jesus Christ, and John the Apostle said, and I quote, we tried to stop him because he was not following us. In Luke 9.46, the disciples argued about something. I quote Luke 9.46, An argument arose among them as to who was the greatest. Have you ever had that argument with someone? Well, maybe not explicitly, but often in our hearts. What's the problem? They're so concerned with themselves. What they're going to get, their status, their authority, their desires, their personal preferences. They're so concerned with themselves that they wanted good things for themselves, but not so much for others. Selfish pride. Specifically, selfish pride regarding their status and position in the kingdom of heaven. And that's a problem. That's a major problem because the kingdom of heaven is not about status and position. It's about service, not status. 
It's about giving, not taking and hoarding. It is about righteousness, but not self-righteousness. And this is why they didn't grasp it when Jesus would predict to them and teach to them that he was going to suffer and be rejected and die and then be risen. Because they didn't get this about the kingdom. That what defines the kingdom of heaven is sacrificial love for the sake of others. That's how the kingdom is established through Christ. And that's how the kingdom lives and is manifested and perseveres in this age. Sacrificial love for the good of others. The disciples didn't get that. Some of you are further along in that than the rest of us. But have patience and grace with us. Sometimes the flesh is willing, but the spirit is weak. But is your life defined by sacrificial love for the good of others? Is that how you think of church? Is that how you think of your place in the community? At work, it's the kingdom way. But now here's what happened. They had walked with Jesus longer. They were with him from the beginning. They had a more intimate relationship with Jesus. They were with him all the time. They traveled with him. They were closer to him. And they were given a much more prominent role in the kingdom than other followers or disciples. They were called and made apostles, sent out mission trips. So they were there longer. They knew him better and were closer to him. And they had a more prominent role. So in their hearts, what they struggled with and what they came to think is that uh, they should be first and they wanted to be first and they deserve to be first. But now if they are first, what does that mean about everyone else? It necessarily makes everyone else last. Last. And so this parable is Jesus' way of saying you must become last and you must make others first. Now it's probably a good time to give you a fair warning about parables, okay? Parables are stories or illustrations from the real world that teach truths about the kingdom of heaven. Those truths are surprising. They turn our understanding of things upside down and inside out. And they're often, these truths told in parables, are often shocking and often offensive. Sometimes parables are speaking judgment against those outside of the kingdom. And they are offensive to those outside of the kingdom. Think Pharisees. But sometimes parables are to those inside the kingdom to give an offensive word of fatherly discipline. And that's the category of this parable. Parables, here's that fair warning, show us things inside of our hearts that we do not want to see. But can we just collectively agree? Well, hopefully you agree with this. Can we collectively agree today that it's good when God shows us our sin? Sin that is not seen will never be grieved. Sin that is not grieved will never be repented of. And brethren, that's what we want. To see and to be grieved and to repent and to be transformed all the more into the likeness of Christ. Kingdom hearts are not me first, you last hearts. In fact, if you want to, look down at verse 26, Matthew 20. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. You see the definitions of first and last they get turned inside out and upside down in the kingdom of heaven. This is a matter, beloved, of seeking out, not shutting out, of welcoming, not refusing. We are here to help others toward a blessing, whether each other, whether those at home in your family, or whether those in the community. We're here as ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven to help others move toward blessing, not to put up barriers, metaphorically, okay, and hoard these blessings for ourselves. Jesus turned water into wine, but he does a greater work 
turning me first hearts into kingdom hearts, that we would be so transformed that we're not just concerned with good things for me, but good things for others. And this is the context. There's a problem in the heart of disciples. Now I want to key in on the key truth. Uh, look at verses 14 and 50, 15 with me. Take what is yours and go. Now he said that to who? He said that to the group who came first but lined up last, right? But I wish to give. Now see, circle that word. Give. I wish to give. This is the key truth here. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? See, the blessing is his to give. Or is your eye envious because I am generous? The King James and New King James will uh, translate this way. Is your eye evil? Is thine eye evil because I am good? Generous, good. This is the key truth, the generosity of God. And God's goodness uh, is talking about uh, good things he does for people. Simple definition. He plans good things. He does good things. He gives good things to people. His goodness is an expression of his inner love. God is love. And he expresses that love in goodness toward others. And look at uh, chapter 19, right just before this. Chapter 19, verses 29 and 30, there's a specific goodness, a specific generosity that's in view. Everyone who has left, uh, this is after, remember the disciples said, well, what are we going to get? We've left everything. What, what's the payback? Verse 29, Jesus says this, Everyone, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my sake, not just some, but everyone, will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. You see, now that's the ultimate gift. That's the ultimate generosity. That's the ultimate goodness of God. He gives eternal life, and that's the context. And then look at verse 30. That should look familiar. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. And then he tells the parable, and he reiterates the same exact thing. He just flips it. In verse 16, so the last shall be first, and the first last. The generosity of God. First of all, God's generosity. Are you still with me this morning? God's generosity is merciful. What that means is that he's generous to sinners. He does good to those who have done harm to him. And aren't you glad he does? He seeks runaways. He restores and lifts up the fallen. He loves haters. Romans 5.8 God shows his love for us. In this, and remember I said goodness is it's an expression of his love. God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He invites and he welcomes and he forgives and he rejoices in lawbreakers. God is generous to sinners. He's merciful. We are a people who do not deserve to look at his vineyard, let alone be called into it, be given a task inside of it, and receive a reward for that task. But Jesus died on a cross so that we could have eternal life. He shed that blood for us. He shed that blood for you so that your sins could be forgiven. And you could be made a laborer in His vineyard. His generosity is merciful. His generosity is faithful. And what that means is when God says He's going to give something, He always, always, always gives it. He doesn't hold back. You and I hold back. You and I forget. You and I are inconsistent in heart and action. But God holds the line. As sure as the sun gives light, it also gives heat. Just as sure as God speaks His word, that God keeps His word. He's faithful. And His generosity is faithful. If He says, I'll give salvation and eternal life to all who come to Christ, He will give salvation and eternal life to all who come to Christ. Not just those who came first, but to all. And therefore, if God's generosity is faithful, therefore, it's always the right time to come into the vineyard. It's always the right time to answer the call. 
It's always the right time. Whether you're 8 or 18 or 38 or 88, today is the right day to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Today is the day. It's always the right time. Why? His generosity is faithful. It's merciful. It's faithful. Thirdly, his generosity is impartial. It's impartial. And what that means is that God does not play favorites. You see, people play favorites. But God does not hold back his gifts from certain kinds of people based on those people. Are you listening this morning? Romans 2.11, there is no partiality with God. Deuteronomy 10.17, God does not show partiality or take a bribe. Now, if you're growing a sapling, you can twist that sapling to grow in a certain direction. Maybe you need to straighten it out. Maybe you want to do something artsy with it. You cannot twist God. You cannot twist the character of God. You cannot twist the generosity of God. You cannot buy good things from Him. And you cannot buy Him off to avoid His wrath. He's impartial. And therefore, not only is it always the right time to come to God, but all who come get the same matchless gift. And isn't that the point of the parable? All who come get the same matchless gift. Yeah, there are different seats at the table. <laughs> but brethren, it's the same table and the same feast and the same master of the house. Will you come? You see, that's one of the things I want to know this morning is who will come to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation? Who will come and profess Jesus Christ is my Lord? I'm repenting of my sins. I'm believing in Christ for salvation. He's my Lord. Who will come? Who will come? But that's the key truth here. God is generous. He's generous beyond comprehension. He's generous beyond our expectations. He's merciful to sinners. It's always the right time to come to Him. Brethren, it's always the right time to come to Him. And whoever comes, all who come, get the same matchless gift. Now, personal application. Do you want it? David, brother? Brian, personal application. God's generosity that we just summarized, you could talk about it till the Lord returns and not grow bored of it. His generosity calls for repentance and rejoicing. It calls for rejoicing because in Christ, God has given us unimaginable treasure. And it calls for repentance because this treasure has not transformed our hearts the way it ought to. And I can prove it to you. Okay? If I were to announce the word has been handed down, it is official, no going back, that stimulus checks have been tripled, have been approved, have been expedited, so that you will get yours tomorrow, the room would erupt in jubilation and gasps. And a sense of joy and security would wash over you. And for those who are able, you'd start doing cartwheels down the aisle and we'd have to rebuke you. <laughs> but it's not even that. If I just announced that after the service, we're giving away free pizza to everyone and $100 gift cards to your favorite store, our hearts would melt with gratitude and rejoicing. And yet, how often... Do we hear phrases like this? God is generous to sinners. And we sit unmoved. Our hearts have not been transformed by the generosity of God the way they ought to be. That's what was true for the disciples. And that's why Jesus told this parable and other teachings as well. But this is a call for repentance and rejoicing for disciples if you have ears to hear it, this is the message today. God gives, God gives, God gives, and God gives. And he doesn't just give things. He gives the very best things. Things that will never lose value. Things that will never lose beauty. Things that can never be taken away. He's forgiven your sins. Christ has reconciled you to God. He's given you eternal life with God that will never break, that will never fade, and that will never disappoint. 
And yet we treat things in the world as better and more worth our time. And even still, he loves us. And in our hearts, we find joy and security and hope and peace in things of the world rather than in God's kindness. And still he loves us. And still he has mercy for us. And still he calls us his own. I hope you can catch. I hope the Spirit will give you just a glimpse of God's generosity this morning. It is merciful. It is faithful. And it is impartial. This calls for great rejoicing and solemn repentance. Now, I believe this has a Roman numeral one, or at least a number one on your outline. Am I right or wrong about that? God's generosity brings us into a glorious kingdom. Look at verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven. For the kingdom of heaven. This is a lesson about the kingdom of heaven. Also called the kingdom of God. This is a glorious kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is how God brings all things under his rule. Okay? Just in a general sense. It's how God um, brings things in the world under his dominion. Uh, Number one, his kingdom is a kingdom of redemption. His kingdom is a kingdom of redemption. That means it's a kingdom where sinners are saved from sin through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I know somebody wants me to repeat that. It's a kingdom where sinners are saved from sin through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Saved from the guilt of sin that's on our record. Saved from the corruption of sin that's in our heart. And saved from the eternal consequences of sin that's in our future. You need a life vest or some flotation device to save you from drowning. You need an antibiotic or some kind of medicine to save you from an infection. You need the death and resurrection of Christ to save you from sin. The kingdom is a kingdom of redemption. The death and resurrection of Christ is the way God establishes the kingdom, and it's the way sin enters the kingdom. Sinners enter the kingdom. Excuse me. Sinners enter the kingdom through faith in Christ, faith in his death, faith in his resurrection. Christ's kingdom is a kingdom of proclamation. A doctor's job is not just to diagnose what's wrong with you. He must tell you what's wrong with you. He must tell you the remedy. He must share the information. And brethren, you and I are not called just to enjoy the kingdom and enjoy fellowship in the kingdom, but we are called to proclaim the kingdom to the world around us. What do we proclaim? We we proclaim point one. We proclaim redemption that is in Christ. We proclaim his death. We proclaim his resurrection. Christ's kingdom is also a kingdom of invitation. Now, how would you feel if your parents threw you a birthday party and didn't invite anyone? How would you feel if your employer threw you a 50-year anniversary um, celebration dinner? And didn't invite anyone. Uh, You would think to yourself, you know, he doesn't quite get the concept of a party. You must invite others. And so it's a kingdom of redemption. It's a kingdom of proclamation. We proclaim the redemption that's in Christ. And we invite others. And I invite you now. Come to Christ. You're welcome. Christ is never done this and he'll never do it. He'll never turn away a sinner who comes to him in faith and repentance. And so we proclaim and we invite and forth Christ's kingdom is a kingdom of transformation. And that just means when you enter into the kingdom of God, you don't stay the same person. You're changed. You're changed by the Spirit. The body needs water to live and the soul needs the Holy Spirit to come alive. The health and hydration of the body is essential for the life of the body. And the presence and power of the Holy Spirit is essential for the life of the soul. This is a glorious kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like Roman 2. God's generosity is brought to us by a generous master. Now verse 1, this is important. Verse 1, the kingdom of heaven, right, glorious kingdom, is like a landowner or like the master of a house. So there's a vineyard involved, but it's not that the kingdom of heaven is like a vineyard. There are workers involved, but it's not that the kingdom of heaven is like the workers. No, no, no. The kingdom of heaven is like the master. There's there's a lesson here about the heart of the master, namely the generosity of the master that's meant to transform us. You see, we won't understand discipleship until we understand the nature of the kingdom. 
And we won't understand the nature of the kingdom until we understand the heart of the Master, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, that's what transforms us. A generous master. Number one, our master is in charge of everything. Now, I know sometimes we like to live under the illusion that we're in charge of some things. He's just in charge of the main things. No, he's in charge of everything. It's his vineyard. We're his workers. Number two, our master gave everything. He gave everything. Jesus gave everything. He gave his life in death. He gave everything. And brethren, he gives everything. He gives us the very best gift of all. He gives us himself. He gives us God. Eternal fellowship with God. He's in charge of everything. He gave everything. And he, number three, receives everyone. He receives everyone who comes in faith and repentance. He receives everyone who comes in faith and repentance. He doesn't receive anyone who wants to come on their own terms, by their own methods. But he receives everyone who comes in faith and repentance. It's a glorious kingdom. It is given us. He's given it to us by a generous master. In Romans 3, God's generosity is our only hope and assurance of this gracious reward. I wanted to put great riches for this, the great riches in Christ. But it's a gracious reward, our only hope and assurance. The laborers in the vineyard, some came at six, some came at nine, some came at noon, some came at three, some came at five. And they all received the same generous, gracious gift. It's always the, have I said this yet? It's always the right time to come to the Lord. And all who come get the same matchless gift. You can come to Him today. Nothing is stopping you but unbelief or some kind of fear or nervousness. But it's not because God is holding back a good gift. Now, do you, do you think the Master was unfair? Well, no, He kept His word. Verse 13, he answered to them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? That's exactly what he agreed. They both agreed. I'll, and that was the promise. I'll give you a denarius. I'll give you a day's wage. He gave it to him. No, he's not unfair. But he's overwhelmingly, offensively generous to others. Now, brothers and sisters, is this not the truly diabolical aspect of the parable? That the thing that upsets them, because they could not have been upset at unfairness, because there was no unfairness, but they are upset. The thing that upsets them is a kindness shown to others. What a devilish, horrible thing to be upset by. A generous thing, a kindness, a goodness to others, and then now here they come up and grumble and complain at the one who expressed that kindness. Heaven forbid. Heaven forbid. Now why would they get upset at such a thing? I gave you some of the details earlier. They were with him longer. They knew him better and more closely. They were given a more prominent role. Uh, but why still? What's going on in the heart that they would get upset? Well, why does one child get upset at another child for having a toy that he or she wants to play with? Why do you get upset when you don't get your way at home or at work or at church? Why do you get upset? Why do we get upset when we don't get our wish, our preference? And not everybody rejoices in our idea, but somebody else's. Why does a kindness or goodness expressed to someone else have the tendency to make us grumble and complain and be critical and be negative and bitter? Why? Selfish pride. Now, praise the Lord, if we've been born again, sin is not master of the house any longer because we're filled with the Spirit. But you know it all too well that sin still lives in the house, wreaking havoc and violence and destruction. And I said this on Wednesday. I forget if it was last Wednesday or two Wednesdays a night. We were talking about something similar, and I and I was talking about the, the process of sanctification. God makes us holy and transforms us to the image of Christ. And, and one of the things I said was this. Make sure you're in the battle. Make sure you're in the battle. Don't give up. Keep fighting. Keep striving. Keep praying. Keep repenting. Don't give up. But that's the problem here. Selfish pride 
underneath of this is, is this problem. God's generosity has not reshaped their hearts the way it ought to. And so they misunderstand discipleship. Why? Because they misunderstand the kingdom. Why? Because they misunderstand the heart of Christ, his generosity. As long as I'm focused on me, and you are focused on you, and he is focused on him, and she is focused on her. Did I use my pronouns correctly in that? Someone who teaches English, let me know. We'll never move forward the way we ought to in the kingdom. We'll never treat each other the way we ought to in the kingdom. And collectively as a church, as long as we are focused on we, we are focused on us. See, I caught that one. We won't, we won't have a kingdom effectiveness the way we ought to. Our hearts won't be transformed in relation to, with respect to those around us the way they ought to. Now, what's the remedy? Think about this with me. What's the remedy? Certainly the remedy cannot be this, and I highlight this because this is the first place we go to. Certainly the remedy cannot be do more work. Certainly the remedy cannot be I need to work harder. Certainly the remedy cannot just be I need to come to more ministry things. Do more jobs. That's not the remedy. The problem in this parable nowhere is alluded to that they didn't work hard enough. That they didn't do their work well enough. The problem is in their heart. It's not been transformed by God's kindness and generosity to others yet. And so what needs to happen is the generosity of God in Christ, a.k.a. the gospel, okay, must become the window through which we see everything else in the world. Most especially how we see ourselves and how we see others. The generosity of God must become the paradigm. It must become the lens. It must become the window through which we see everything else. First, with respect to ourselves, so that we could see how grateful we ought to be. And we would become humble servants. And then also with respect to others, that we would honor them. And not be upset or bitter because of what they've received. This is the path of discipleship. We must humble ourselves by the kindness of God and the grace of God. We must learn to honor others and seek their good more than our own. We must become, brothers and sisters, last. We must become last so that others might become first. That's the message. Let me just run by you some specific applications. We've talked about the problem in the heart. How might this manifest in our lives? Uh, what are some things we need to be mindful of? Do you want to hear these? Vince, you want to hear these? Well, we need to have a revival in our hearts about the mission-focused nature of the kingdom. Oh, by the way, let me say something real quick about the kingdom and the church. The kingdom of God refers to the spiritual realities or the spiritual blessings that come to us in Christ. Okay, the church is the gathering and the fellowship of the people who've received those blessings. Okay, so they're related, but they're not exactly identical. But um, we're not here just for ourselves. We're here first for the glory of God. And then that's, that's the first commandment, love the Lord. What's the second commandment? Love others. Love others. Right? In the church, home and family, and then the world around us through missions. But you see, we've got to become last. We've got to put others first. We've got to have a revival of the mission-focused nature of the kingdom so that we would desire and strive and work and work and labor and pray for good things for others, lost sinners specifically. And number two, we must have a revival in our hearts about the spiritual nature of the kingdom. It doesn't operate by worldly measures. We don't judge by worldly measures. Like if we have more people, some, somehow that means that we're doing a better job. Or if me, more people start coming to things, or working harder, that means we're doing a better job. That's not how things are measured in the kingdom of heaven. Humble service, things like this. Humble service, self-sacrificial love toward each other, commitment to truth. Right? These, are the, these are the kinds of things. Uh, number three, we must have a revival in our hearts that kingdom greatness and kingdom status is not determined by your work, not by the amount of it, not by the quality of it. Number four, and this is an extension of that one, because there are different ways we think that our work 
gives us a special status or a special privilege. Um, it, sins are not excused or excusable because you've been laboring in the kingdom or the church for a long time. Are you awake this morning? Some of us, I, I, I'm telling you, not just us, but just in general, wherever there's Christians, wherever there's a church, wherever there, these spiritual struggles are real, I think one of the things that manifests today is we're, we, we're in the church for a long time. We've done lots of jobs over lots of years, and we have just uh, secret sin, maybe, or uh, public sin, gossip, slander, critical spirit, whatever it might be, uh, that, that lingers on and on and on, and we don't see it. We don't grieve over it. There's no, it's not even on our radar to repent of it. We think we have some kind of special status and exception because we do things in the church. Doing things in the church is uh, a fruit of salvation and a fruit of sanctification. But you can fake it. You could definitely fake that. And what I mean by that is you could do lots of things, lots of things, and still be lost. Or you could do lots of things and be saved, but you're not on a process of sanctification. Just because we've been doing something for a long time doesn't give us a special exception clause that we can live in certain sins and not care about it. That's not the kingdom way. Now, final question for this morning. What does it mean that the last, exactly, what does it mean that the last will be first and the first will be last? I'm going to do two things on this, okay? What does it mean that the last will be first and the first will be last? Chapter 19, verse 30, many who are first will be last and the last first. Chapter 20, verse 16, the last shall be first and the first last. In case someone asks you this week at work, hey, what does that mean? I want you to know exactly what to say. Number, number one, it means in the kingdom of heaven, worldly standards of fairness and acceptance do not apply. In the kingdom of heaven, worldly standards of fairness and acceptance do not apply. So the world would say, well, this one's done more. This one should be first. And you come into the kingdom of God, that's off the table. The world would say, well, he's better at doing that, so this one should be first. You come into the kingdom of God, that's off the table. Worldly standards, what fallen man thinks is fair and what should happen, does not set the table for the kingdom of heaven. Those things are off the table. Now, number two. What does it mean that the first will be last and the last first? In the kingdom of heaven, the first are last and the last are first because in Christ, everyone is first and everyone is last. Now, I want this to sink into your heart this morning. In Christ, everyone is first and everyone is last. In Christ, everyone is lined up first because everyone, everyone in Christ receives the ultimate reward in full. He'll hold nothing back from you in the glories of heaven. In Christ, everyone is first. No one who has come to faith in Christ will fall short of a grand entrance and glorious inheritance in, in heaven. And in Christ, everyone is lined up last. In Christ, everyone is lined up last because in Christ, everyone is to become a lowly, humble servant of others who in different ways is constantly telling other people, you go first. In Christ, everyone is first and everyone is last. And so the last are first and the first last. Does that make sense? Self-sacrificial love establish the kingdom. Jesus Christ suffered and died on a cross to establish the kingdom and to give you a way to enter into that kingdom forever, that you would never be run off or kicked out. Self-sacrificial love established the kingdom, and self-sacrificial love is the way of the kingdom, in the kingdom, for laborers of the kingdom. You know, everything in the world te will tell us that life is about your comfort. Life is about your comfort. Life is about your entertainment. And you, at all costs, you pursue your comfort, you pursue your entertainment, and anything from the outside, any authority structure, any institution, any truth, any opinion that's going to infringe upon your comfort and your entertainment, you stay away from it. 
The kingdom of God is not about your comfort, and it's not about your entertainment. It's about becoming a humble, lowly servant. Luke 12, 32. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. In a shocking generosity, God has given us a glorious kingdom. And he's put over us, and he's brought, brought that kingdom to us by a generous master, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's promised us in Christ a gracious reward. And that's why you press on, brothers. When sorrows come, that's why you press on. When discouragements come, you press on. When doubts come and fears come, you press on in faith till you reach that reward. And when persecution comes, you press on. There's a gracious reward. 1 Peter 5, 4. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. And in that day, all will be first. All who had made themselves last will be first. I want to invite you to come and give your life to Christ today. And the way you could do that is, is very simple. Either, either during the song that we're about to sing or after the service altogether, just come up to me and say, Pastor Matt, I want to give my life to the Lord. I want to place faith in Him. And I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I'll just announce that and pray for you. And then we'll set up something to meet together and study the Bible about that. Pray about that. Give you spiritual counsel about that. All right, let's pray. Let's pray and then we'll stand and sing. Father, we thank you for your generosity and your kindness. I pray for each of us that your kindness in Christ would change us. If we're lost, that we would be saved. If we're saved, that we would repent of certain things and be further sanctified. As a church, I pray that your kindness would make us more missions-oriented. Father, we pray for the outreach the next few days, that you would use it for your name, for your glory, not ours. Make us last. Make us humble servants. It's in Christ we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. Father, till Christ returns, 
We ask that you would watch over us in grace and compassion. Christ, I pray. 